and welcome back to the mystery theory. Today, we're going to cover a case that will take us back to the summer of 1974. A lot was happening that summer. Major events like Watergate and some other that you probably do remember, but not related to this story. However, we're gonna travel back then, but to Cheryl Miller. who was 21 years old and it all started on a Friday night on June 13, 14 before I tell you about what happened to Cheryl that night I want to ask you to give this video thumbs up, leave a comment if you'd like to help spread the word in this video with other people who are looking for true crime ASMR. Now, let's talk about what happened. Cheryl was an art student who has been in a relationship that was very unhealthy. So that Friday night, she decided to go out with her friend and also roommate Maxine. They were not sure where they go, but they ended up going to the scene bar, mm. which was the most popular bar in that town in Michigan. But trying to forget about her boyfriend, Abbas, she actually found him there. They had this awkward look, <laughs> and she couldn't really relax or have fun. Later on, he leaves, and Cheryl decided to enjoy the rest of the night. At some point, she decided to go home, but her friend wanted to continue partying. So she got on her motorcycle and went back to the apartment. At 6 a.m., Maxine eventually got home, and the apartment was silent. Cheryl, she assumed, was sleeping, She still had to pass her room to get to hers. So she peeked and she saw Cheryl laying on the floor, 
signs that a fight broke furniture and stuff broken and thrown across the room she grabbed her friend Cheryl by the shoulder panic shaked her friend to see if she was alive she was bruised very much and she wasn't waking up so Maxine called the police Investigated and soon enough knew exactly where the killer had entered the apartment. There was a scream that was taken off the window in the downstairs room. The curtains were hanging outside the frame. Was raining. They couldn't determine when he had the killer had entered the property, if before or after Cheryl. She was also cover some fluids and two dark hairs and they determined that she died before 5 and 6 a.m. One of the peculiar things about the samples is that semen um, was sterile. Um, there's a big explanation on how they determined that. But um, just take it as a big factor to consider in an investigation. When started questioning people they learn about the ex-boyfriend. They knew that Cheryl described him as um, having a terrible temper, possessive, um, and apparently he'd been harassing her he wanted to be with Cheryl. So he had a motive. They also found his fingerprints on the banister going up to Cheryl's bedroom. And the hair color He was from Iran and when police went to interview him they learned that he had left back home. Cheryl would have died Saturday morning and her ex-boyfriend as Vihani sold his car and everything he had in the next two days buying a ticket to go back home that 
next Monday. Of course, this could have been because he couldn't take seeing his ex-girlfriend. Moving on. But it could also mean that he was responsible for her death. So, they the authorities arranged for Esfahani to be picked up in Iran. <clears throat> they didn't know how likely it was to be extradited back to the US, but Authorities did send a sample of his hair, and they did not match. Now they had another suspect, Antonio Alvarez, which happened to be Maxine's cousin. He was going through a rough time, and he was staying for a few weeks at Maxine's and Cheryl's apartment. <coughs> His fingerprints were found all over the house or the apartment, but of course he lived there. His hair was similar to the ones found on Cheryl's body, too. But Antonio wasn't sterile, so <laughs> it wasn't him who raped Cheryl. And he was quickly eliminated as a suspect. It was frustrating, but they continue to look into other people, like Gabriel Ferris, who was a member of a very prominent family in the area, but he had drug convictions, and an extensive police record. And his fingerprints had been found on a dresser in Cheryl's room. Apparently, he'd been seen Cheryl, and their relationship ended recently, when he got married. On top of that, Gabriel was a blonde, and he was not sterile. He also had an alibi. He was in a hotel about 60 miles away in his honeymoon. Police were really trying their best. Out of the three suspects, two were eliminated, and the third one was out of the country. So, of course, they strongly believed that he did it. Now, the police had found a hairbrush in his apartment, and it did not match. So, they believed that the authorities from Iran sent a wrong sample. 
when they compare the brush hair to those on the crime scene, they were inconclusive. This was very frustrating, and it turned into a cold case. Twenty years later, there was a break in the case. Terry, I guess, who was now the former wife of Mr. Ferris, who was in the honeymoon with in that hotel. Well, he informed them that she had not told them the whole truth. She initially told police that Gabriel had gone to bed at 10 and stayed until 5. But now, she said that she woke up alone that morning. And that he came back a few minutes later, saying that he had gone for a drive. She noticed some spots of blood in his jacket and he said that he hit a rabbit while driving that the rabbit not only was hit but it was lodged in the wheel well of the car and that he had to pull it out Later in the day, Cheryl's murder was in the news. And she said that Gabriel started crying, or pretend to be crying. And he said that he was crying because Cheryl was the girl who he dated before they met. Um, this is 20 years later, and she is the ex-wife now. <sighs> so, it would have been possible for him to wake up in the middle of the night, drive to Cheryl's apartment, kill her, and come back to bed. Remember that he didn't have black hair and he wasn't sterile and his fingerprints were there because he used to be intimate with Cheryl Now, there's a perfectly good explanation for all this Apparently now, with new technology, it's allowed for them to match these hairs to one of the other suspects, Antonio Alvarez. However, they just, um, they contended that these had not been put on Cheryl's body by the killer, by her killer. And that they believed that the hairs were lying on the carpet and kind of attached to the victim's skin. As she was struggling with her attacker. <coughs> And then, the fluids that they say now, police say, this wasn't semen, but fluid from the victim's body. The fingerprints 
wasn't so much about the fingerprints, but rather where they found it. This was just inches from Cheryl's head. Then we're left there by Gabriel Ferris while he was strangling the life out of his victim. It was a solid case. They knew that they had enough to convict him. But the state of Michigan was determined to hold Gabriel Ferris to account. And so this took a few tries. was brought to trial for a third time. The first two trial hmm. we had problems with the timeline. I guess the wife was saying that he came back just as the sun was coming up, which would have been at 6 a.m. And Cheryl died between five and six. Would leave him enough time to drive back. They also said that it would have been impossible for you know, the crime scene to not have hair from the attacker after all that struggle. And then Alvarez's hair found on the victim, the ex-boyfriend having a motive. Why would this guy who was getting married all of a sudden decided to kill her? And why that night on his honeymoon? Well, there's a good explanation. And it's that he actually arranged to meet with Cheryl the previous night. The night of the party. He wasn't able to leave So he decided to go visit her on his honeymoon instead. He hoped to be intimate with her one last time, but she said no. She didn't want to be intimate with a guy that just got married. So he decided to take her by force. And in the process, he choked her. They believed that it could have been an accident. Still, she wasn't alive. It's raining hard. <laughs> I'll open the window up for a second. <laughs> case. It's now in the hands of the jury, really, and this guy was so cocky that he believed <laughs> that he was going to be free. That he was going to buy a boat and live his best life. But he was found guilty. Almost 30 years to the day that Cheryl was murdered. And he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. This took a really long time. And her 
family, well, I think your parents, died before this was solved. Taking the life of this girl by a selfish man who still claims to be innocent. Some people believe him and believe that he was wrongfully sentenced and, you know, charged. stop raining and they come out and uh, hold on and there's one of my girls that is in heat and they're screaming bloody murder until she'll go and get over it so if you can hear them in the background you can hear them with my headset, so I apologize, but it's uh, nature is calling for this <laughs> goats. And the funny thing is, it's the baby goat that is so desperate to get to this girl <laughs> that is in heat. I mean, he's so short; I don't think he could do the deed, but still excited. But to end this case, I think I wanted to cover some of this cold cases solved because it gives me some sense of hope for, remember the Snapchat murders, those girls that went on a hike and, you know, today it's a big mystery and there's a bunch of theories and, you know, John Benet Ramsey, those cases that we all know, and that they have a big question mark. I just, those cases give me hope that maybe one day we'll know what happened, even if it takes two, three, four, five decades or more. I think it's never too late to learn the truth. A horrible ending with a bunch of theories while well, it was cold. But now we know that sometimes it's not as crazy or out there as we think. And most of the time, people that we know are the ones that are likely more involved in these cases, you know, the family of the victims, the friends, the neighbors. parents' shoes, losing their child. That even though she was old enough to go to a bar, have drinks, or even serve in the military, we still think of our kids as kids. <laughs> no matter how old they are. So thank you. Thank you so much being here today. I'd love to know what you think. And I'll talk to you guys next time.